uh, before I read uh, what's on, what I have to read and say, uh, I have a special small talk since we have time. We have to start at 11.50. You know, uh, Dr. Kelly. Without Dr. Kelly, we have no foundation. He's the one who inspired us to have a foundation. He gave us hope. He gave hope to all the families. If it was up to me, you know, he should get the Nobel Prize, not just of science and medicine, Nobel Prize of humanity, with his compassion, his ethics. He never asked any family for anything in return. We bombard him with emails. His email is full. I think every day, I don't know how many emails he gets, 50, 60, just from us and our doctors, because we give his email to our doctors too, and they email him. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, Dr. Kelly was uh, the former director of the Division of Metabolism here at Kennedy Krieger Institute for many, many years. And uh, he currently does uh, research at the Division of Genetics at Boston Children Hospital. He came all the way from Cape Cod uh, in Massachusetts to be with us today. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Can you hear me? Okay. I hope this goes well. I somehow got it in my head that my talk was after lunch, not before. I knew it was the last talk, so I quickly put the slides, put the slides in order. So I hope it's. I hope they are not too far out of order. So I'm going to go over, I'm going to talk about metabolism in Cat 6A, and that's my area. And I, um, the, although one would not ordinarily think of a syndrome like Cat 6A as metabolic, and there's virtually nothing in the, there is nothing in the literature about metabolism. But metabolism is important to understand if there is an abnormality because it's one of the few causes of neurological problems that can be treated. And uh, so when uh, Dr. Esper had contacted me, I had heard of CAT 6 a but never seen anyone with it. And I simply said, well, it doesn't hurt to take a look and see what we can find. And uh, I was interested in part because the first paper I published as a graduate student was on histone complexes, the fact that they form complexes. So here, 35 years later, all of a sudden, there's a syndrome that I'm asked to look at. And it became very interesting, as I hope you will see. So the, um, I'm going to talk about mitochondria and how they work. I know some of you who were here last year. I'll be repeating that. And then I'll talk about, I'll update some of our studies on, um, on the cause of the metabolic abnormalities that we find. And then I'll also um, go into more detail about specific treatments. And that has, our thinking about the treatment has evolved just in the past, past six months. Um, so I'll, I'll bring you up to date on, on that. And uh, that, of course, will end with uh, treatment. And there's a new treatment that we're looking into, possibly very feasible treatment. Whether it will have an effect or not, we don't know. But uh, Dr. Voss can study this in her, in her mice. And um, <coughs> the, the, the drug, the drug I have known, is being used in clinical trials. And um, it will likely be licensed for another set of conditions. Um, but it, it might be something that could be used clinically. It's not a, um, a dangerous drug. So, okay, it looks better up there than here. So th this, again, is um, just to say that there are is there a point out of it? Is there a pointer on this? I don't know whether there is. There we go. Okay. I got it. So, um, so this is just to show that um, 
again, just repeat that histones. Histones are in here, it's an eight histone complex, and there are many different sub substitutions of these complexes. What is shown here is mostly methyl groups and acetyl groups, but I'll go into that in more detail later. Uh, we know that acetylation, the acetyl groups, are what most uh, affected uh, in Cat6A, the acetyl group here, but um, chromatin is modified by other compounds, and the enzyme, Cat6A, is an enzyme that puts acetyl groups on mitochondria, and they, um, that enzyme has other activity. It can put other compounds on these substitution sites in the chromosomes, in the histones, and that may be relevant to, or they presumably have different functions. It's not fully understood yet, but we need, because the enzyme is deficient, it'll be deficient in the activity of substituting groups other than the acetyl groups, and that's something that we're just starting to look into. So for those who are <coughs> familiar with mitochondria, they are in all cells, the little organelles that make energy. I'm sure everyone has heard of them, and there are complex structures with inner and outer parts, and there are membranes where a lot of the energy metabolism goes on, and there's what's called the matrix, which um, involves both energy metabolism and other processes. Mitochondria are very dynamic. This is, uh, I don't have a, a video of it, but you see these, um, these football-shaped uh, organelles inside cells, but they actually form in many cells a uh, very complex network and they move. They move in and they move throughout the cell and they move to where energy is needed most. And that's not necessarily so relevant in CAT6A but in some other disorders including uh, some forms of autism that movement of mitochondria is important. That is, some children have abnormalities in the ability of mitochondria to move. The mitochondria are normal, but they don't get around in the cell where they're supposed to go, and that itself causes disease. The, uh, inside the matrix here, this part here, so this is where the electron transport chain is on the so-called Christie of the mitochondria, and the matrix, this part here, has a lot of other enzymes in them, about a thousand different proteins. And the major function, uh, or one of the major activities that goes on inside the matrix is the citric acid cycle, all called the, uh, the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And anyone who's studied biology in college usually hates the citric acid cycle. <laughs> But it's, it's very important to understand, and, and medical school students will go into shock sometimes if you put up a slide of uh, the citric acid cycle. But it's very important to understand how it works, especially the, um, especially the amino acids that I've diagrammed here is where all the different uh, uh, amino acids that I derive from, from protein where they all feed into the citric acid cycle. And this is important, uh, we'll come back to it later with methionine, because if there's an abnormality in the function of the citric acid cycle up here, then sometimes certain amino acids are overutilized and become deficient in the body. So one thinks about the mitochondrial problem as interfering with ATP synthesis, but in fact, most mitochondria make close to normal amounts of ATP, but the way they make it sometimes can be very damaging to the cell. That is, if they use, use a form of methionine to make ATP uh, by drawing it into the citric acid cycle, the cell starves to death. And that's, in fact, the cause of a lot of uh, brain injury in mitochondrial problems. I, I probably should mention while we're going into mitochondria. If you look up mitochondria or go to like the United Mitochondria Disease website, it sounds like a death sentence. And the, uh, it, this is a completely different kind of mitochondrial problem. Not that um, it can't cause trouble, it can, but it's not necessarily progressive in the way that you read about. And it's, there's really nothing 
about this type of mitochondrial dysfunction. I call it mitochondrial dysfunction rather than a disease. It uses, it involves the same systems, but it's, uh, it's very different in terms of consequences for a, a patient. Uh, so you can, read, you can read about how mitochondria work, but almost nothing written about diseases of mitochondria have any relevance to, cat, to cats since they, there just isn't anything in the literature. Um, so one of the main ways, if, if you go back, just to go back to, to this again, all the amino acids and protein, so glycine, alanine, serine, cysteine, a whole bunch here make alpha ketoglutarate, all the 20 amino acids and protein eventually will, if they're not resynthesizing the protein, they're utilized for energy and they have different entry points in the citric acid cycle. Therefore, if the citric acid cycle is not working well, that will have consequences on the levels of amino acids. Either an amino acid like uh, asparagine can't get in because of a block in this area of the citric acid cycle, and that level will be high. Or, as I said, methionine might go in a lot faster than it normally does, starving the cell, starving the body of methionine. So we look at amino acid levels in, in blood, in plasma, to understand how the citric acid cycle is functioning. And to do that, one has to draw a sample specifically at, as many of you know now, between four and five hours after breakfast, which is a very special <coughs> point of metabolic equilibrium. And we can get the most information out of amino acids. This is a, a patient I saw with autism, pervasive de developmental disorder. Uh, here at Kennedy about 30 years ago. And um, what was interesting about his, th oh, so th these are the amino acids in plasma showing what I show on the specific acid cycle diagram. And he had high levels of glycine and alanine and a high level which is shown right here. And what I wanted to show here is that the, the the levels here are about twice what they should be relative to the, the average. So the average for glycine is 205, and the average for uh, alanine is 288, and they're about twice normal here. But if you look at other compounds like valine, it's the same as that, and leucine is almost the same. And you go on down that list, and it's just those two that are disproportionate and that's what we're looking for. And if you summarize, if you go through this and analyze, um, collect samples on many different patients, um, you can learn something uh, about it. So that was one child who had, who had autism, and that got me interested in, in collecting more data. And what th this shows is a summary of looking at two different types of autism. One can divide autism, uh, between regressive children who uh, lose skills at usually between 12 and 24 months and those that are have abnormal, have problems for the birth. Um, and it's not to say they're entirely separate, but there are two ways of clinically defining uh, the type of autism a child has. To a, someone with a metabolic training, if a child regresses, that is, if a child loses neurological function, that's a metabolic disease to prove otherwise. That's just uh, what we know. And what the literature dismisses, pretty much dismisses the idea that, modern, that any significant fracture in children with mitochondrial disease have autism. And that's because most, uh, even though mitochondrial disease causes regression, uh, the, the biochemical abnormalities are much more uh, severe than we see in, uh, in the sample I showed you on the child with uh, PED. But if you use the Fortif, and that's part, the re reason it's not been seen, this is why it's important for the four, four to five hour fasting, is that it's often done after overnight fasting. And that's 
from my perspective, uninterpretable if you're trying to learn about mitochondria. So when you do that, just to show you, whereas a study done with what overnight fasting sample in, in autumn shows nothing, if you divide, if you do it at four to five hours, you see a very striking difference. In children with aggressive autism here, like that first child, have high levels of alanine and glycine. And when you add the two up, there's almost no overlap with normal, which is here, and with abnormal, which is I, I, with um, non-regressive autism there. So it just shows how, what you can learn from amino you know, acids. That, that is diagnostic what's called complex one deficiency, which can be caused by many different lesions in mitochondria. So the next step, now that we know it's complex one deficiency, is to investigate in what way complex one is not functioning. So to go to CAT, to CAT 6A, what I, and this is an update from the uh, figure I had last year. What we see in CAT 6A is uh, an amino acid pattern that I would not necessarily, it, it, we do see it in mitochondrial disease, but not in typical mitochondrial problems, but it's, these abnormalities relate to mitochondrial metabolism. And these four uh, amino acids here, alanine, asparagine, proline, and citrulline, they, um, they are often affected in the mitochondrial problem, especially alanine um, and, and uh, that's, that's the main one. I don't show glycine in this one. Um, so the, uh, what we see in CAT6A, even though some children don't have the abnormality, a significant fraction have these very high levels. Uh, this is the upper limit of normal here. Uh, and you can see that quite a few of the children are above normal and as and as a group it's statistically significant that they have increased levels of at least those three and even proline I haven't circled it but you can see there's a disproportionate increase in, in that and it will vary from child to, to child or even in the same child but it's such a, a consistent or, or a, a frequent finding that we have these levels that are increased so I then focus on how can that come about? What could be causing that? Because as I say, it's not a typical mitochondrial problem, but one can relate the abnormalities to mitochondrial And again, just to emphasize here that we have an increase in, in, uh, in, in asparagine is increased, and I don't have Citrulline is not on here, it, 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 it's on the next slide. But again, the asparagine, if that's increased, it means that there's something, something, there's a problem here in uh, asparagine getting into the citric acid cycle, it's converting to this compound here. And then the next step is to make citrate, and I'll come back to that because that's turning out to be a very interesting uh, phenomenon in cat 6 a from the standpoint of treatment citrate levels are low. In that sense, though I can't explain the mechanism, it makes sense that if asparagine is high and it's not being converted into uh, oxalacetate, or there's a block here, then citrate is going to be low. And I've started <coughs> measuring citrate in patients with CAS-6A, and it is low in, in most patients. Why is citrulline high? It might be, uh, it might follow this pathway here in that um, if the, um, if, if citrate is high, if citrulline is high, then it, um, if, if, so if citrulline is high, then it'll go through this pathway and it can't, this, if, um, There is, if, if asparagine is high and can't go into the citric acid cycle, it can go in this reverse pathway here to make citrulline. 
Um, so citrulline is simply a marker. It's, it's a marker that the fact we find both citrulline and asparagine increase tells us that there's a block in entry of, of asparagine into the citric acid cycle and low citrate. So this confirms, in a sense, or gives a mechanism, or is additional information that our finding of a low citrate level is significant. So the, um, the, the treatment, there are a number of treatments that we have given. This here is basic mitochondrial treatment. And what we've been using most, or what we know works in CAT6A is giving carnitine and pentaminic acid. Uh, cornstarch, some children have overnight fasting that they're, they can have low blood glucose early in the morning and in other mitochondrial problems, cornstarch to stretch out the nutrition overnight. And then we give a antioxidants, which uh, uh, there's often in a mitochondrial, a mitochondrial problem is damage to the part of the mitochondria that makes ATP. And uh, by giving these three antioxidants, coenzyme Q10, vitamin E, and vitamin C, and they must be given together for it to work. That, that undoes a lot of the damage that might have accumulated to mitochondria. This is very standard treatment in mitochondrial disease in general. And there are some cat 6 children and adults where if I look at the age range uh, in cat 6 there is evidence that mitochondrial dysfunction gets worse with age, which is, you see, in a lot of mitochondrial problems. So some of the medical issues that are developing in adolescence and early, uh, in early adulthood, some appear to be caused by this progressive mitochondrial dysfunction. And because the mitochondrial aspect of CAT6A has not been recognized, doctors trying to treat the various problems are very, they have no idea what the cause is. So this is something we need to make known. Uh, and then the methionine, as I, I mentioned, the thionine can be depleted. Tyrosine is another compound, uh, amino acid, that can also be low, and we need to replace those. <coughs> what's, what's interesting is that when there's mitochondrial damage and the thionine is low, we give the thionine and the children get better. After a couple of years of treatment uh, with the antioxidants to improve, to reduce the damage to the mitochondria, they no longer need the thionine. So that's evidence that the antioxidant treatment is really doing something. I should also mention there's a tremendous amount of negativism among many physician groups that antioxidant cocktails don't work. And, it, and that's true. Most, and most, most of the cocktails used don't work, but they're not compounded. They don't work together correctly. Um, and that's something else I'm working on, not just for casting state, but for educating my colleagues about how to treat mitochondrial the dysfunction. I mentioned that because I wouldn't be surprised some of you have heard from your doctors <coughs> that these cocktails don't work. Um, but I, I have a different opinion, suffice to say. So why does, uh, we, we can see very clearly, especially in many children, that just giving carnitine um, can help. And you give, like, we give catatonic acid, which um, it biochemically uh, increases the, um, the activity or the effectiveness of carnitine. And what is happening, this is one possibility, that carnitine carries acetyl, is converted, acetyl-CoA comes out of the mitochondria, the citric acid cycle, uh, from citrate is converted into acetyl CoA, and that can be converted to acetyl carnitine, get out of the mitochondria, and then be converted back uh, into acetyl CoA, and then freed up into acetate. Acetyl CoA cannot get into the nucleus of the cell where the histones are, but acetate can. So acetate get, gets in, and then is converted back into acetyl CoA. And the concept there, or the, or the reason that uh, this was, uh, this, the reason we think that it is beneficial is that 
CAT6A is, a, is so called a haploid insufficiency genetic disease where there's half the enzyme is still there, but there's only half of it, and therefore there's reduced function. And anything that we can do to make the mitochondria, make that enzyme what's left, the other half of it, work better, will might help the children. This is this is very standard uh, approach to metabolic treatment, is to increase the activity of what what, what enzyme is left. And there are dozens of metabolic diseases that are treated that way. And it seems it, it seems to work. It clearly does work and this is one mechanism. However um, the the other possibility is uh, there's not much literature on it, but there is. There's an enzyme which is normally in the citric in the in the mitochondria, but the same enzyme has now been found in the nucleus of the cell. Pyruvate dehydrogenase. <coughs> pyruvate dehydrogenase is an unusual enzyme in the sense that carnitine can in it will, it's like a switch. A certain portion of the enzyme is not active. But if you give carnitine, it, it, it switches on some of the residual inactive pyruvate and hydrogenase. So that's another possibility, as the carnitine is working more as a switch to turn on pyruvate dehydrogenase, which then converts pyruvate, which comes from the mitochondria, uh, through the cytoplasm again. And the, um, and that will provide more acetyl-CoA and stimulate the activity of the residual, or increase the function of the residual CAT6A protein. So, so if, we've also seen one of the major, one of the most striking abnormalities to me as a pediatrician in CAT6A is the type of intestinal dysfunction, intestinal motility. And what we've seen in a number of joint cats is a really severe crisis of abdominal pain to which no specific function can be found. And another problem that is rare in pediatrics but appears to be quite common in cat 6 a maybe 5 to 10 percent of children, is inosusception, which is a disorder where the, the bowel uh, telescopes on itself, it inverts and pushes in. To one one portion pushes into the other, and that will occur if, if there's dysmotility, if the if the movement of the gut, the contraction of the gut muscle is not smooth from top to bottom, it can work against each other and cause in the susception. And giving citrate, I don't know if it's in everyone, but in most children with Cas6A who've had these crises, citrate treatment eliminates them. And this is something I have worked out. It's a severe type of mitochondrial intestinal dysmotility uh, called pseudo obstruction. And that also responds to citrate. Again, this is something that's not in the literature, it's just something I have worked out on my own. And uh, we obviously need to get it in the literature. And not, I've told many of my colleagues about it, and it is being used, but cats. To talk to publish something on CAT 6A may be a very good way to get that in a literature book for CAT 6A and for other children. So, what I think is going on here is that uh, the reason that citrate, so citrate, tricit citrates is a commercial form right now, and um, that is, is, is comes out of the gut, is taken up into the cell. Citrate is then converted into, into acetyl-CoA uh, and oxalacetate, and then uh, the acetyl-CoA then and can enter the acetyl-CoA acetyl pool that comes from the mitochondria, and um, you can enter the pool here and increase the level of acetate, and, and in theory, now that I think this through, the ability of citrate to increase the amount of acetyl-CoA is probably greater than carnitine. And one thing that we, one of the things we have to approach from a clinical 
research standpoint is what do we use? Do we use citrate only when there's a GI trouble? Do we use uh, only carnitine or do we use both of them? The, what happens in uh, the reason that citrate works <coughs> in the gut dysmotility is that uh, citrate comes out of the, uh, the citric acid cycle and again in cat 6 a it's low and then it in the cytoplasm as I just showed it makes acetyl -co acetyl-CoA and that acetyl-CoA is the only source that, of acetyl-CoA that can be used to make acetylcholine and acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter of, of the gut. So patients who have pseudo-obstruction, like CAT6A, they have, a, they have a different mitochondrial problem that causes low citrate, which then leads to obstruction because they're not making enough acetylcholine. At least that's the most reasonable hypothesis. So in CAT6A, the citrate clearly helps the uh, dysmotility for the reason that it works in other mitochondrial problems, but it also may be increasing the acetylation that we want to uh, make work better. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, histones are modified by a whole series of groups, um, and acetylation and methylation are the two main, are the two most prominent ones, as we see here. Some, ly some lysine uh, can have three methyl groups on them. Uh, but then there's the acetyl group here from CAT6A. But there's also uh, propionate groups, propionyl CoA and butyl CoA and proton CoA, which function very similarly to acetyl CoA. And that some sites in the histones are specifically have um, the, the propionate groups. I can't find it. Can't see it from here, but there are some. There, there are some groups that are specifically propionated. You can probably see it better than that than I can. And what's been found is that these groups, or the, the regions of the chromatin where the propionate groups attach, tend to be those that regulate the function of genes, turn genes on and off. And one of the issues that it raises in my mind is that if we're giving a lot of acid, a lot of uh, if we're trying to increase the acetyl-CoA level, we know that works, it helps in certain ways, but in, we will also be decreasing the relative amount of propionate that will substitute in these perhaps very special regions. So while acetyl-CoA is helping, maybe we would get a better effect if we did both propionate and acetate. And as I, I mentioned, there is a way of doing that. This is just to sh show you what the compounds are. It's just different numbers of carbon atoms. Acetate is two, this is the same as vinegar. And then propionate, this smells terrible. And butyrate also is pretty, pretty bad. Uh, these actually are produced, most of the source of these compounds is from the gut bacteria. Microbiome, as you call it. This is where these compounds come from, um, and that may be why there's an interaction between that and metabolic function. And um, if you look at the different groups, so, so what, what this is are the are the different lysine amino acids in the histone, and what groups attach to them. And this one here in particular, but actually this is a uh, uh, lysine that gets three different substitutions. Um, and this is acetate here, and that's, that's this big peak here is all propionate. So there's one amino acid in the, in the histone that requires a lot of propionate for whatever function it has. So by giving it only, increasing only acetate, then we may have trouble or we may be interfering with the, with the propionate. And there is this compound called triheptanoin, which is broken down in the mitochondria into these seven carbons, and it's broken down into. Uh, I'm sorry, it's. Um, I, I didn't. 
I didn't break this down here, is broken down into two acetic acids and one propionic acid. Um, and then that goes into the trihedronone, gives rise to acetylcholate, which enters the citric acid cycle in the usual way. And then the, uh, it also makes propionyl-CoA and goes into the citric acid cycle and makes succinate. But at least the propionyl-CoA can be made um, very easily from this compound. And as I checked, there's some, it's, it's under clinical trials now, and I checked with the, um, with the PI, the person who's running the clinical <coughs> trials in Pittsburgh and asked him how much propionate is in the blood. And it's roughly a five-fold increase over normal. So simply by giving a certain amount of triheptanoin, which is a relatively it's a safe compound, it's just a kind of fat. Um, uh, most fats have like trionium, fatty acid moves a little longer. So it's very feasible to, to do it. Of course, it's best to try something like this first in mice. So um, that's what, um, I think that, that's, that's one of the, um, the things on the list or implied in the list here. We're going to be looking at um, Dr. Paul's and I working together to explore these different treatments. I can look at the human metabolism side, what we know about it, and she can test things out in, in the mice. Mice are not the same as people, but histones are one of the most conserved proteins in, in the body. And uh, I'm sure there are differences in some of the substitution, but it's very, very likely that much of what we can learn about the mouse uh, substitution of the histones will apply to With regard to um, other sources, the, <coughs> I, maybe I'll, I'll send you, did I send you the paper on citrate sources? Uh, did I send you the paper on citrate sources, food no. sources? I have, there's a patient I follow in Alberta, Canada, and who had severe intestinal pseudo obstruction and, and autism, and I treated him with tricitrates. And, and, the, and the father told me, well, that's sort of interesting that you want to use citrate because we have to lock the refrigerator door because he, our, our son will go in the refrigerator and drink down a whole bottle of real lemon lemon juice. <laughs> and 
he obviously, and this we see again and again, when there's a metabolic disease and a deficiency of some sort, your brain, your taste receptors in your brain will figure out where to get it. Um, some kids um, chew ice because there aren't deficient, uh, but, the, uh, but it clearly is something that we've seen. There's a paper uh, that discusses this, and the, there's, there are two things. There's tricitrates, which is from a citrate content that's twice as concentrated as bicitrate. Bicitra has the same concentration as um, real lemon, lemon juice. And there are some parents who have used that instead of tricitrates. It's more volume. Um, and you can, of course, sweeten the lemon juice and dilute it and sweeten it and simply make lemonade. And that will definitely work. And they, uh, paper gives the equivalencies. Uh, there are also, there are some grapefruit juices which have very high citrate, almost as high as lemon juice. Uh, cit um, grapefruit is a problem with certain medications. You'd have to check with your doctor. But this paper, uh, which maybe you can make uh, available through the research, gives you all the differences. If you look at crystal light, it's got a lot of citrate in it. Citrate is used to make juices uh, taste as a tart. It's tartness. Uh, so a lot of foods with citrate in them. So much so that you see the opposite problem. A child who has high citrate, which some monoclonal problems do, will often have diarrhea. And there is so much citrate in the average child's diet from juices and everything else that uh, I, I, I told the parents just take every source of citrate out of the diet and sure enough the diarrhea went away. So, uh, so yes, it can be treated in that way. And as I say, the other way of dealing with it is to find a, uh, is to come up with an, an argument. It is, it technically should qualify as a medical food. It's a food is, Sense, lemon juice, uh, and there's a specific metabolic um, requirement for it, and, and that's the basis on which one can appeal for the pieces of medical food. I think all states require payment or insurance coverage for medical foods, so that's what we need to do is get it established as a medical food. But, so, <laughs> related to uh, Hypertonic acid, did you try them? Uh, what? Hypertonic acid? Which, which acid? Hypertonic acid, right? Hypertonic acid? Yeah, no, did, you, no, did you try it? No, I haven't tried it. I'm saying it is being used to treat another metabolic disorder. So there's lots of clinical data on the uh, safety of it. It's quite safe uh, and the effectiveness of it. What we don't know what has to be worked out is, I, I think it, it makes, from, a, a metal, from an intuitive metabolic sense, uh, it makes a lot of sense to use it, uh, but it's, it's not like you can take a bottle out of the refrigerator and drink it down, that you, you have to uh, figure out how much is needed, and that's something which can be worked out in, in a mouse model, and then the way, one can make an estimate if we could say triple the level of uh, propionate in the blood, then that's going to have a biologic effect. And that could be one of the research protocols is to give graded amounts and um, try to know it. What it's, it's being brought to the market as a drug. It's going to cost $200,000 a year if it gets FDA approved. But there are other sources of it you can buy from signaling uh, chemical so supply house. So, um, but it, it, it's, you know, I would like to say, I, I have a strong feeling that we need to balance acetate with propionate, and that just makes sense, but we don't know how much, and the PI for the clinical trial for trihectanoin uh, is going to provide specific data uh, from these mouse studies and uh, from these patients. I haven't checked, it might be in the mouse literature. Uh, so, 
but that I think is makes sense. Whether again in computer aid computer aid is not well there actually there is a way of getting computer aid we can make out too much toxins so it's used to make another type of metabolic disease. Protonic uh, acid which is used as free acid stuff. I'm not sure. Um, I would want to give that to someone. But in most cases, when it's prepared as a drug, it's, it's given as a pro-drug. That is, it's, it's a uh, very safe tolerant form that is like, converted into the active compound in, in the tablets. Yes? Hi. Um, my name is Katie. You've been collecting data on my son, Will. I'm sorry, can you speak up? Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Amy Wrightson. You've been collecting data, my son Will, for over 18 months. Um, you've seen good results in him. His amino acid levels are pretty much resemble a typical child at this point. Um, I was wondering if you're planning on publishing any of the data you've collected, and if so, what is the timeline? Yes, the, right now what is available, I gave a presentation at a genetics meeting in August last year. So that, so what I've been doing when a physician wants some more information, it's, it's, it actually will be published in a journal that is published with all the abstracts from that meeting. It's not the same thing as a peer-reviewed article, it is peer-reviewed in, in a sense. But at least it's, it's documented and the, the poster is just in, in a PDF form, so I've been sending that. But yes, the, uh, I think we have an update now to publish it. What I, what I need, what I'm waiting for is some more follow-up studies. This has only been going on for a couple of years, perhaps, and it takes a year to a year and a half for, it takes 18 months on average for mitochondria to heal if a child is on a mitochondrial cocktail. What I have seen in a couple of patients is that after 12 months, the asparagine level drops down to normal. If it was high beforehand, it drops down to normal, and certain other changes occur to say that the mitochondria are better. I have experience with monitoring these levels for other mitochondrial problems, and I know what to expect in terms of how long to, to wait. As I say, it's roughly 18 months children who are on a cocktail. Um, and the just giving carnosine might reverse some of the mitochondrial problems because it, you know, it makes the mitochondria work better and they don't damage themselves. When mitochondria don't work very well, they tend to damage themselves. Uh, so, so yes, that's a goal, not immediately. I haven't written a paper or a draft of a paper yet because I, I need six months at least well, I'm waiting for follow-up data after a year of treatment. At this time last year, I had data on 27 patients. Now I have data on close to, uh, close to double that. So those patients who I was following a, a year ago, they're now coming up to those 27, not all of them, coming up to next year's so one-year measurement. Uh, I've seen two patients where it's clearly, I have one year of follow-up where this patient came down. And that'll be important. It'll be important. I could publish the biochemical abnormalities, but I think it's more important not only to show that there are these biochemical abnormalities and speculate about the treatment, but to show a treatment response, especially because, as I said, there's such negativism in medicine about treating mitochondria. If you go to the, which I'm saying you shouldn't do, but if you go to the UMBF website, it says there's no treatment for mitochondrial disease, which is just wrong. Um, it's, uh, it's quite treatable in most patients. I, I follow several hundred patients with mitochondrial disease, and it's quite treatable in most cases. Hi, my name is Sonia Gates. I have an 18-year-old son that was just diagnosed. Are there benefits to doing this with older children? Are there benefits to the supplementation in older children? Yes, there's a, a young man in his, in his 20s who uh, has been 
an understatement. I mean, maybe you can say, has it helped him? Okay. So, this young man here who just recently diagnosed and has been on treatment for about a year, I think, or not like that, and he's getting better. So, if, if, if the mitochondrial dysfunction, no matter what the age of a person is, if the intestinal mitochondrial dysfunction is reversible, not all of it necessarily, but the, what I showed you in terms of antioxidants used in amino acid supplements, we, we tailor it to the individual child or adult, and then um, we see we see improvement in mitochondrial function both by the amino acids and the children. <coughs> the children with, with autism, it's about a third, about a, between 40 and 50 percent of children with autism have a mitochondrial type of matter. and yet autism specialists in effect, refuse to acknowledge that. <laughs> um, and, but it exists and it is treatable. The problem, I should say, with publishing that, uh, most of you probably know someone who is a child problem, is that the, the, the data not only say why or show that there's abnormality in our common function, uh, but it also it, intuitively and, and by I can expressly say that it, it treatment benefits the, the children. And yet, if everyone else in the field denies that it's real, uh, and I publish it right now without a proof of treatment response, doctors aren't going to use it, and parents are going to stop giving their children immunizations because that, that's a great fear that if someone has a mitochondrial problem and you get an immunization that it might cause trouble, even though that's extremely rare. It'd be, it's really a public health issue. And I, again, I'm trying to work on that. So I think for Cassic say it's no problem. Once we have an adequate amount of data, we can publish it. For autism, the data I showed you, that's actually 10 years old. And the, uh, I should say that my colleagues here at Kennedy Creamers, when I was here, that just to show you what we can be up against, that taking that data that I showed you, which has you know, unquestionable statistically significant data, that was submitted to five separate funding organizations saying, just when I do a trial, take 20 patients with and without regressive form, treat them, and show that they get better. Every application was turned down because the authorities in, in Austin said, one said that is an epiphenomenon which means it's really not related to autism. And uh, another one said that if a child has mitochondrial dysfunction, then it's, then it's a mitochondrial disease and not autism. Uh, and it's, it's, a real, it's a real problem. And then we're dealing with the issue of immunization and vaccines, and therefore you just can't throw out your data with, uh, and ignore what the public health concept I just wanted to say, my son is 33, we just started the Mitospectra four months ago, and we were really having trouble with him losing weight, and we immediately had seen it start to stabilize, so that was one really positive thing. Um, I assume all follow-up tests, meta, um, lab tests, you, Dr. Kelly, you want done after the four hours of fasting? I'm say it again. You, the, Fat, the lab tests that we did originally, we did after the breakfast and four hours fasting, I assume all follow-up lab tests would have to be the same? Yes, yes basically. Uh, if, if there are specific medical issues that a child has, um, that may dictate other issues. Um, the why there's weight loss. It's not something, we don't see weight loss with mitochondrial treatment in general. In fact, we usually see the opposite. Children are not gaining weight and uh, And once they're on mitochondrial treatment, they can better. But this is we're just learning about CAT 66A, and I can't say there's not a relationship. Yeah. One Hi, I'm Dr. Kahali. Sorry. Um, my name is Amanda. We've been treating my daughter, Sarah, for about the last year. Um, she has had two negative reactions to fentanyl when under anesthesia and 
given the metabolic impact of CAT6A, I was wondering if that has any impact on how we should address this with anesthesiologists for future procedures. The first time that she had it, um, it was given intranasally at the end of an ear tube surgery, and she stopped breathing on her own entirely. <laughs> the first time uh, she had a reaction, it was at the end of an ear tube surgery, and they gave it intranasally, and she stopped breathing on her own. Um, the second it was, time... It was an allergic reaction, or it looked like an allergic reaction? It was not an allergic okay. reaction. Um, the second time they gave it to her was a longer surgery. It was a dental surgery, and um, she was under for about two and a half hours. They expected us to be up and out of the hospital by noon, she didn't wake up on her own until 1.30. Um, we had already warned them about the previous episode and told them not to give fentanyl. They didn't listen. <laughs> the anesthesiologist came back in the room and said, oh, I guess she really is sensitive to fentanyl. <sighs> well, um, <laughs> I have to look up the metabolism of fentanyl. Um, it's an opioid, opioid like drug. Um, but I don't know exactly how it's metabolized. If there is any, if Charles Cass would say would have intrinsic sensitivity to it, then it might be able, it might be able to explain that based on, on the metabolism. I don't. Most opioids, I wouldn't expect them to uh, to have a metabolic effect per se. But the I guess one way of explaining it, uh, the uh, if one, and I have to look at amino acids again, if someone has a deficiency of tyrosine, which is one of the amino acids which often is low, that can manifest as chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, where you have trouble with blood pressure, maintaining blood pressure after being up and walking about for 20 or 30 minutes, uh, and um, giving a very small amount of tyrosine Change, uh, completely reverses that. So it's, um, I'm not saying that's what the problem is, but it's just to say that um, it, I would have to look at the specifics of the reaction, think about what the mechanism of the reaction was, and then look at what we know about the biochemistry of cats to say to see if there's some reason that they wouldn't be able to handle the fentanyl. And some people have bad reactions to, to fentanyl. It's a pretty potent drug, uh, and it's, it's hard to it's hard to dose it to some some kind, especially in children, because it is one has to be a tiny amount of the drug for it to work, so it's easy to overdose. Thank you. What what time is the lunch? What what time is the lunch? What? Of course, I'll be, I'll be meeting with some families after the after three o'clock, I think it is, um, so we can hear some questions. Okay. Thank you. It's actually recording. <laughs> um, yeah. It's still recording. Yeah, I guess I can stop it. And I